Petrus Apex. That is the Petrus portion of the temporal bone. The Petrus Apex. The Petrus Apex is the pyramid shaped anteromedial part of the Petrus part of the temporal bone. The Petrus Apex. The pyramidal shaped anteromedial part of the Petrus part of the temporal bone. It is oriented obliquely in the skull base and articulates with the posterior aspect of the greater wing of sphenoid and occipital bone. Articulating with the posterior aspect of the greater wing of sphenoid and occipital bone. The lateral boundary is the inner ear. The lateral boundary is the inner ear. Medially is the petrooccipital fissure anteriorly and the petrosphenoidal fissure and petrous part of the internal carotid artery in the carotid canal posteriorly, the posterior cranial fossa. I repeat again, the lateral boundary is the inner ear, medially the petrooccipital fissure, anteriorly the petrosphenoidal fissure and petrous part of the internal carotid artery in the carotid canal and posteriorly the posterior cranial fossa. Superiorly is the middle cranial fossa, Meckel's cave and Petrus internal carotid artery. And inferiorly is the jugular bulb and inferior petrosal sinus. The internal carotid artery divides, I repeat, the internal carotid artery divides it into a larger anterior portion containing bone marrow that may be pneumatized and a smaller posterior portion derived from the otic capsule. The petrous apex is the pyramidal medial projection of the petrous part of the temporal bone. The normal petrous apex is relatively simple in form with only one principal variation, the degree of pneumatization. That is, the apex may be variably pneumatized with aerated connections to the middle ear or may contain predominantly marrow fat. What makes a petrous apex anatomically complex is its medial location in the skull base and its intimate relation to other clinically important structures including the cavernous sinus, Dorillo canal and Meckel cave. The petrous apex represents a unique intersection between the suprahyoid neck and the intracranial compartment. Hence, the petrous apex is susceptible to a variety of pathologic processes including intrinsic lesions of bone, pneumatized air cells or the petrous internal carotid artery, intracranial processes with the inferior extension or superiorly invasive nasopharyngeal or sinonasal lesions. The petrix apex of the temporal bone is located anteromedial to the inner ear with the angle created by the greater wing of sphenoid bone anteriorly and the occipital bone posteriorly. So that will be the conical projection and it is located anteromedial to the inner ear with the angle created by this angle created by the greater wing of sphenoid bone and the occipital bone posteriorly. The anterior margin of the petrous apex forms the medial posterior wall of the middle cranial fossa. The anterior medial margin of the petrous apex forms the medial posterior wall of the middle cranial fossa. The most inferior and medial exocranial margin of the petrous apex is separated from the clivus by an ovoid horizontal gap, a small ovoid horizontal gap. That is called the foramen lacerum, which contains a bridge of dense fibrous tissue and cartilage. Now, above the foramen lacerum, the internal carotid artery exits the medial opening of the carotid canal on its way to the cavernous sinus. I repeat again, the petrous apex of the temporal bone is located within the angle created by the greater wing of sphenoid and the occipital bone 
the anterior margin forms the medial posterior wall of the middle cranial fossa and the most inferior and posterior medial exocranial margin of the petrous apex is separated from the clivus by an ovoid horizontal gap called the foramen lacerum. Three-dimensional anatomy of the exocranial surface of the petrous apex that is the three-dimensional anatomy of the exocranial surface of the petrous apex of a healthy 27-year-old woman. Now the image shows the exocranial surface of the petrous apex that is number one that is the petrous apex a pyramidal projection. Now number two is the ovoid gap that is number two the right foramen oval. Now number three is the foramen lacerum bridged by fibrous tissue. Now the ovoid gap between the petrous apex and the clivus is the foramen lacerum. The carotid canal opening is here that is the carotid canal opening through which the internal carotid enters into the petrous carotid canal and number five is the jugular foramen. I repeat again this is the exocranial surface of the petrous apex. This is the foramen oval that is a foramen lacerum the carotid canal opening here and number five is the right jugular foramen. Just medial to the trigeminal impression the tip of the petrous apex gives rise to a discrete fibrous tissue bundle that crosses medially across the petroclival fissure within the meningeal and periosteal dural layers to the base of the ipsilateral posterior clinoid process. Now this bundle is termed the petrosphenoidal ligament also called the Gruber's ligament. Although not typically identified with routine imaging this structure is important because it demarcates the superior boundary of a dural invagination called the Dorillos canal. Dorillos canal is an anatomical channel from the dural margin along the petroclival junction to the posterior cavernous sinus and contains the abducens nerve. The Dorillos canal contains the abducens nerve, the sixth cranial nerve along with portions of the basal plexus and inferior petrosal sinus. Lesions of the petro petrous apex or petroclival junction are notorious for invading or compressing the Dorillos canal and causing six cranial nerve palsy that is the Dorillos canal this is the Gruber's ligament high resolution T2 weighted MRI sequence of the skull base can identify the six cranial nerve and associated dural sleeve within the proximal aspect of the Dorillo canal the inferior exo cranial surface of the petrous apex is intimately related to the nasopharynx. The inferior exocranial surface of the petrous apex is related to the nasopharynx. The petrous apex is connected medially to the clivus by dense fibrocartilaginous tissue of the foramen lacerum that merges with the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube. Invasive neoplasms of the nasopharynx thus can traverse the sinus of Morgagni and readily gain access to the bony skull base including the petrous apex. Now this is a three dimensional anatomy of the exocranial surface of a healthy 27 year old woman. I repeat again this is the petrous apex. This is the foramen oval that is the foramen lacerum that is the carotid canal opening and this is the jugular foramen. Petrous apex pneumatization. In general the petrous apex is composed of dense bone and bone marrow. Pneumatization of the petrous apex op occurs when epithelial lined air cells develop as medial communications from the mastoid air cells.
Now this occurs in 9% of patients and in general there is a positive correlation between the degree of mastoid segment pneumatization and aeration of the petrous apex. Pneumatization can be highly variable and involving a large portion of the petrous temporal bone or only a small posterolateral segment. The SLs in the petrous apex are susceptible to similar pathologic processes that occur in the mastoid segment including obstruction, opacification, inflammation and infection. Now of the pneumatized petrous bones, 7% are asymmetrically pneumatized. Now this asymmetry can have two important effects. First, it can create an asymmetric appearance during routine radiologic evaluation suggesting a possible underlying pathology. Now second, it provides a template for asymmetric development or progression of true pathologic processes. This is a three-dimensional anatomy of the endocranial surface of the petrous apex in a 27-year-old woman that includes schematic representation of its relationship with important adjacent base skull base structures. Image shows a 3D reformation of high-resolution CT of normal skull base. Now on the left side, important skull base structures are shown schematically in relation with the left petrous apex. Segment 3 foramen lacerum of left internal carotid artery that is the left internal carotid artery immediately beyond the intertemporal course and course of left trigeminal nerve that is the trigeminal nerve trigeminal ganglion ox, occipital maxillary mandibular divisions of the trigeminal ganglion in the Meckel's cave the trigeminal nerve trunk approaches towards the petrous apex with gradual expansion towards the petrous apex with as it forms the trigeminal ganglion in the Meckel's cave immediately above the petrous apex. There are three branches from the trigeminal ganglion namely V1 and V2, medial two branches and the lateral branch. Slightly lateral course of left abducen nerve that is the left abducen nerve towards the left petrous apex through the Dorolos canal. The small space located between the petrous apex and the petrosphenoidal ligament, they are identified. Asymmetry fat marrow in petrous apex. Asymmetric pneumatization is related to another normal variant, asymmetric fat marrow within the petrous apex. Now this finding is a common incidental finding on brain, skull base and soft tissue neck studies obtained for evaluation of non-autologic complaints. Typically, normal marrow, marrow contains significant adipose tissue and signal characteristics parallel those of scalp or orbital fat. Fat marrow is hypertent intense on routine T1 and T2 weighted sequences and confirmation is made by observing the complete loss of signal with fat saturation techniques such as TER sequence and frequency selected frat suppression sequences. Now this shows asymmetric fat marrow in the left petrous apex in a 45 year old woman being evaluated for multiple sclerosis. The unenhanced non-fat saturated T1 weighted image reveals smoothly marginated T1 hyperintense lesions in the left petrous apex. Cephalocele, bony defects in the petrous apex. Petrous apex cephalocele are relatively uncommon. Grossly, petrous apex cephalocele represent cystic expansion and herniation of the posterolateral portion of the Meckel's cave into the supramedial aspect of the petrous apex, and as such, they are CSF filled structures lined by dura and arachnoid of variable thickness and may contain some prolapsed fibers of the trigeminal nerve. Unlike cephalocele of other areas of the base of skull, Petrous apex cephalocele do not contain any brain tissue. Now this is a 39 year old woman with cephalocele of the left petrous apex. Now on this coronal T2 weighted image, the T2 hyperintense lesions of the left petrous apex follows CSF signal characteristics. This image clearly show herniation of left Meckel cave into the petrous apex. Now on the right side, the inferior margin of normal Meckel cave is marginated by bony petrous apex.
vascular lesions petrous internal carotid artery aneurysm aneurysms of the petrous segment of the internal carotid artery are rare especially when compared with aneurysms of more distal intracranial segments petrous segment aneurysms are thought to originate from congenitally weak areas in the arterial wall at the origin of several embryonic vessels petrous internal carotid artery aneurysms are typically asymptomatic and may be incidentally discovered during workup for unrelated symptoms and they may surprisingly be large at initial diagnosis and occasionally such aneurysms may present with headache diplopia horner syndrome or pulsatile tinnitus now this shows the petrous internal carotid and artery aneurysm in a 66 year old women who presented with a 2 year history of headache the left petrous internal carotid artery aneurysm on this maximum intensity projection of ct angiogram there is a large aneurysm arising from the petrous portion of the left carotid artery aneurysm has expanded left petrous apex without any definite bony erosion inflammatory lesions effusion of petrous apex hair cells a petrous apex hair cell communicate variably with the middle ear and are susceptible to similar pathologic processes that affect the middle ear and mastoid hair cell during inflammation infection and obstruction opacification of these hair cells can occur in conjunction with otitis media and can persist despite resolution of middle ear disease and of, and of clinical symptoms due to obstructed drainage related to adhesive fibrosis along communicating hair cells or hair channels such persistent fluid in the petrous apex has been termed trapped effusion and appears to have no further clinical relevance pathologic and microbiological evaluations have shown the fluid to be non purulent in nature and to contain no microorganisms now this shows the left petrous apex effusion in a 49 year old man being evaluated for altered mental status with no otologic or ophthalmologic symptoms on fat suppressed t2 weighted image there is a t2 hyper intense lesion in the left petrous apex on non fat suppressed t1 weighted sequence the lesion was hypo intense and did not show any enhancement with contrast administration cholesterol granuloma cholesterol granulomas of the temporal bone can occur in the mastoid segment the middle ear and the petrous apex in fact cholesterol granulomas are the most common primary petrous apex lesions the exact mechanism that initiate formation and allow perpetuation of cholesterol granulomas are not clearly understood and the prevailing hypothesis suggests an initial obstruction to an air cell development of a vacuum phenomenon repeated cycles of hemorrhage inflammatory response and gradual expansion due to bone remodeling and resorption and the advancing margin represents a fibrous capsule without true epithelial lining now in this case that shows the right petrous apex cholesterol granuloma in a 35 year old man who presented with hearing loss on an unenhanced t1 weighted image there is significant remodeling of the right petrous apex lesion is heterogeneously hyperintense on unenhanced t1 weighted sequence because of extracellular methemoglobin cholestatoma cholestatoma of the petrous apex are synonymous with epidermoid cysts these lesions are considered to be congenital in origin and are ectopic res of embryologic epithelial tissue in the petrous apex this tissue forms a cyst lined by stratified squamous epithelium as internal desquamation occurs from the lining keratinized debris accumulates centrally with a highly organized structure enlargement of the cholestatoma occurs gradually as a advancing epithelium combined with host inflammatory response results in surrounding bone resorption congenital cholestatomas are slow growing lesions and may be asymptomatic for years common clinical symptoms are caused by progressive mass effect include hearing loss cranial nerve palsy according to location and headache hearing loss is sensory neural and due to involvement of the retrocochlear auditory apparatus This is a congenital cholestatoma of the left petrous apex in a 32 year old man who presented with a left sided hearing loss on T2 weighted image there is expansion of the left petrous apex and the lesion appears very bright apical petrositis 
Overt infection of the petrous apex, apical petrocyte, is a relatively rare complication that occurs when infection, infectious automastoiditis extends medially into the petrous apex, usually via pneumatized air cells. Initially, intact petrous apex air cells are opacified with purulent exudate. With progressive infection, the epithelium is invaded and destroyed and the surrounding supporting bony trabeculum and inner cortical margins undergo demineralization and resorption. Infection then spreads beyond air cells to the adjacent marrow space of the petrous apex, essentially forming a localized osteomyelitis of the skull base. Now at this point, infections can spread directly to the outer cortical margins of the petrous apex and cause permeative and destructive changes. This process can also involve the cortical margins of the carotid canal and can lead to vasospasm or arthritis of the internal carotid artery. Infectious exudate can also invade and traverse multiple intraosseous veins that communicate directly with the dural sinuses and veins of the skull base, resulting in thrombophlebitis and sinus thrombosis. Ultimately, meningitis, encephalitis and intracranial abscess can develop. This shows the left petrous epicytis in a 27-year-old man who presented with history of left middle ear infection, hearing loss, sixth cranial nerve palsy. On contrast enhanced T1 weighted image, there is a heterogeneous enhancement of the left petrous apex. Posterior aspect of the lesion enhances intensely. Also note the subtle enhancement of the left mastoid and middle ear cavity. Tumors, chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma of the skull base are slow growing moderate to well differentiated neoplasm that typically originate off the midline from cartilaginous remnants of the petro-occipital fissure. Up to 28% of cases it may arise from the clivus. Chondrosarcomas are lobulated tumors that invade locally by advancing medially to involve the clivus and superiorly to involve the cavernous sinus. These tumors also have a propensity to extend laterally and inferiorly to involve the petrous apex and foramen lacerum. This feature often results in broad contact with and effacement of the petrous internal character artery. And clinical presentation depends on the overall size of the lesion and associated cranial nerve involvement. Clinical presentation vary from non-specific headache or craniofacial pain to specific intracranial neuropathies, especially abducent palsy. Now this is a left petrous apex chondrosarcoma in a 71-year-old man who presented with deep headache and sixth cranial nerve palsy. On T2 weighted image, lesion was characteristically T2 hyperintensity. Bony expansion is also evident. Left petrous apex chondrosarcoma. Hematogenous metastasis. As part of the skeletal system, the skull base is susceptible to hematogenous spread metastatic disease. Within the temporal bone, the petrous apex is the most commonly affected site and is involved in 80% of reported cases. Adenocarcinoma is the most common cell type and primary breast malignancy is the most common source. Other metastases occur in patients with lung, prostate, skin or kidney cancer. Metastatic disease to the petrous apex often occurs late in the course of malignant disease and may be incidental and asymptomatic in a patient with evidence of multifocal skeletal involvement. Now, In these cases, diagnosis is seldom in doubt. Rarely, petrous apex involvement may cause persistent symptoms of headache, sixth cranial palsy or hearing loss in a patient without known cause cancer. Careful search of the initial CT or MRI examination is necessary to identify and exclude or exclude additional marrow fine lesions of the skull base, calvaria, upper cervical spine or facial bones. If the lesion is solitary, differentiating the lesion from myeloma, chondrosarcoma, chondroma, invasive or intraosseous meningioma or even petrous epicytis may be difficult. This shows the left petrous apex metastasis from a breast cancer in a 50-year-old woman being evaluated for bony metastasis from a known breast cancer and on fused PET CT scan, there is moderate to intense uptake of fluid deoxy glucose FDG in the left petrous apex lytic lesion. Plasma cytoma and multiple myeloma. Plasma cytoma is a solitary tumor of neoplastic monoclonal plasma cells in either soft tissue or in bone occurring in the absence of a clinical diagnosis of multiple myeloma.
plasma cytoma is generally regarded as benign unless multiple myeloma develops multiple myeloma represents a malignant multifocal proliferation of plasma cells within established clinical radiological and laboratory criteria for diagnosis plasma cell tumors of the petrous apex may represent solitary plasma cytomas or myelomatous lesions in the setting of multiple myeloma both lesions have a similar radiological appearance ct shows an expansile intraosseous soft tissue mass with lytic destruction of the petrous apex on mri lesions are generally iso intense on t1 and iso to hyper intense on t2 compared with gray matter with moderate homogeneous enhancement and like metastatic disease multiple myeloma generally presents with known multifocal skeletal disease and additional marrow space lesions of the skull base or calvaria may be observed with close inspection now this is a 45 year old man with endolymphatic sinus tumor this locally aggressive tumor has arisen from the epithelium of the endolymphatic sac and has gone grown posteriorly to involve the cerebrospontal angle cistern structures anteriorly to involve the inner ear and also anteromedially to involve the left petrous apex on t2 weighted image tumor is heterogeneously hyperintense paraganglioma the inferior and lateral aspect of the petrous portion of the temporal bone contains the external opening of the carotid canal as well as the jugular fossa which contains the jugular bulb occasionally paragangliomas that is glomus jugular or glomus tympanic tumors of the jugular fossa can erode the medial margin of the fossa and invade the occipital bone and adjacent petrous apex paragangliomas can occur sporadically or as part of a familial syndrome and up to 40% of head and neck paragangliomas are familial and tend to present earlier than the sporadic type and are more commonly multicentric The most common clinical presentation of jugular foramen paraganglioma is hoarseness due to vagal neuropathy followed by pulsatile tinnitus with or without hearing loss. Only 3% of all head and neck paragangliomas secrete catecholamines. Jugular tympanic paragangliomas are usually benign and only 5% are malignant. This shows a paraganglioma of left petrous region in a 54 year old woman who presented with pulsatile tinnitus and hoarseness. On contrast weighted T1 weighted image there is brightly enhancing lesion in the left petrous bone associated with multiple intratumoral flow voids due to high vascularity of the tumor lesions arises from the left jugular foramen which is not seen and secondarily involves the petrous apex paraganglioma of the left petrous region meningioma Meningiomas can affect the petrous apex in four principal patterns. First, given the variable appearance of the apex, the thin cortical shell and the effects of volume averaging, petroclival meningiomas can often appear on MRI and CT to invade the apex proper when in fact they do not. Second, petroclival meningiomas can result in hyperosteosis of the apex with bony sclerosis and expansion. Third, meningiomas along the apex can directly invade the underlying cortical and trabecular bone and the invasive soft tissue component obliterates the marrow space and any pneumatized air cell and results in mixed permeative and sclerotic changes in the apex. Fourth, a primary intraosseous meningioma can rarely originate within the petrous apex, mimicking a primary or a metastatic tumor. Obviously then the CT and MRI appearances will vary considerably according to the type of bone involvement and degree of tumor expansion. The best clue to the diagnosis in most cases is identifying a dura based extraosseous soft tissue component that otherwise has features suggesting a meningioma such as CT hyperdensity, homogeneous enhancement and a dural tail shown on MRI. Endolymphatic sinus tumor Endolymphatic sac tumor is a rare locally aggressive papillary adenomatous neoplasm that originates from the epithelium of the endolymphatic sac and duct. Although most endolymphatic sac tumors occur sporadically, there is a known association with von Hippel-Lindau syndrome and this is a slow growing tumor with four principal growth patterns. Most commonly it grows posteriorly to involve the cerebrospontal angle and less commonly the tumor can laterally can grow laterally to involve middle or external ear through the mastoid air cells superiorly to, to the middle cranial fossa and finally along the petrous ridge to involve the clivus and other central base structures. Now this tumor usually presents with symptoms of endolymphatic hydrops, gradual onset, low frequency, hearing loss, tinnitus, fullness, 
vertigo. Less commonly, patients present with acute hearing loss <coughs> due to acute intralabyrinthine hemorrhage and associated inflammation. So I repeat again, do not mistake these tumors presenting with symptoms of endolymphatic high drops of low frequency hearing loss, tinnitus, fullness, vertigo, we may, we may think it is minious, but actually it is an endolymphatic sinus tumor. The P-trips apex is a complex region of the temporal bone and can harbor lesions which are difficult to access surgically. Pathology of the P-trips apex is divided into extradural and intradural etiologies. Extradural pathology includes cholesterol granuloma, cholestatoma or epidermoidosis and osteomyelitis. Intradural pathologies include meningiomas and schwannomas. And of the P-trips apex pathologies, asymmetric pneumatization and effusion are the most common, outnumbering cholesterol granulomas which themselves have an incidence of 0.6 per million. Cholesterol granulomas are 10 times more common than cholestatomas of the Petrus apex and together these are the most common destructive lesions of the Petrus apex. Petrus apex pathology is usually found incidentally on imaging for unrelated symptoms. Symptoms if present are heterogeneous. The most common otolaryngology complaint is hearing loss but oral fullness and vertigo secondary to compression of the 8th nerve are also common. Now these symptoms are present in approximately 65% of patients with Petrus apex pathologies. Other symptoms include headaches due to involvement of the trigeminal nerve, diplopia from compression of the 6th cranial nerve and 7th nerve related facial spasm or weakness. Severe infection may result in Gradinova syndrome, purulent otorrhea, abducent palsy and otorgia. Evaluation of Petrus apex lesion involves a comprehensive evaluation of the cranial nerve function and audiometry. CT is routinely used to determine the optical, optimal surgical approach if surgical intervention is warranted. MRI can narrow the differential diagnosis without the need for a tissue biopsy. Now what are the various surgical approaches? Anterior approach. The endoscopic endonasal approach EEA, endoscopic endonasal approach is typically indicated for extradural and anterior pathologies of the Petrus apex with recent innovations allowing for lateral lesions to be accessed that would have traditionally been inaccessible due to the location of the internal carotid artery. The endonasal endoscopic approach minimizes risks to hearing or facial nerve, which are typically elevated with lateral approaches, reduces surgical mobility and shortens hospitalization. The endoscopic endonasal approach can also be combined with other approaches to more effectively treat the pathology. Then we have the median transphenoidal approach. The medial approach with lateralization of the internal carotid artery. The transpterygoid infratemporous approach. Endoscopic translacerum approach. Open anterior and endonasal anterior pitrosectomy. Lateral approaches are translabyrinthine approach, transcochlear approach, transcanal infracochlear approach, middle cranial fossa approach. And in conclusion, the Petrus apex remains one of the most challenging areas of the skull base to reach surgically. But with multiple possible approaches, skilled teams of otolaryngologists and neurosurgeons can safely manage Petrus apex lesions. God bless.